So great job, Ken. Thank you. I, I did think that there was a request from ASLA to do the presentations in English. Because I'm in the back, I was like, I needed an interpreter. And what I'm starting to think is, I didn't put enough pictures in my presentation. I, if, if you know me and you've, if I've ever bored you with a presentation before, at least I gave you something to look at. Okay, this is the only photo I have in this entire presentation, okay? This stuff's that boring that you're not allowed to put photos in it, okay? So at least Ken mixed it up a little bit. Thank you for doing that. Because I, I needed visuals. Uh, so anyway, there's some disclaimers here. First of all, I did not write this. That's my first disclaimer, okay? I did not, we were all part of making the industry a better place. And, and I think uh, the changes that we're starting to see with uh, the Model Water Efficient Landscape Ordinance, it's evolved over time. And I think it's all changes for the better. You know, we have a, a shortage in our water supply. Here in California, we're in the fourth year of major drought. I, I, you could claim, you know, one year over the next, it just keeps getting worse. We had some executive orders that really drove home some of these changes. Uh, but by and large, the Department of Water Resources is the governing agency that's really responsible for looking out for our water supply, uh, you know, throughout the state of California. And they have a very difficult job to do to balance the politics of water with the practicality of uh, the delivery of water and, and looking at the long range future, you know, 25, 30 years ahead. And, and, you know, of course, our local agencies are doing that as well. So most of the information that you're going to hear today was taken from the uh, Department of Water Resources uh, website. Down at the bottom here, you'll see that there is a, a link that you could click on. I believe it's a hot link when you, when you open up the uh, the PDF that will be available to you after the presentation. So you can click on that and then all of the different supporting documents are going to be right here on, uh, you know, under those different subtitles. So has anybody taken a look at this so far? Anybody dabbled in it? Okay, some of you. So for those of you that haven't, I don't want to depress anybody uh, with some of the changes, but I also for some of you that, you know, I mean, obviously we're, we're looking to try and stay current with what's going on. So I'm just the messenger, okay? So where we started was uh, the Model Water Efficient Landscape Ordinance, AB 1881, was a revision of AB 325. You remember all the last major drought that we had with 90, the 90s, and then we had the March Miracle, and everybody went from drip back to spray heads, right? So you guys that have been in California and San Diego long enough, remember that we, this, is a, this has been a cycle of how we've done things, right? Well, AB 1881, and I think I believe it was like 2007, 2008 when they started, it, it kind of started growing legs and they started getting some independent technical uh, panels and people involved with this and industry and came together and wrote a document that took place in 2010, okay? So what we're looking at now is the revisions to AB 1881. So some of this stuff that you're going to see on these slides is going to be in gray. In most of that's just stuff that has already been in place, okay? So don't think that everything here is changed. I think there's about 18 unique changes from the original 2010 to what was launched on December 1st of 2015, which is now the new changes to the Model Water Efficient Landscape Ordinance, okay? So anything in blue is going to be the, the new changes, and anything in gray is going to be existing, but it kind of supports the concepts that we're talking about here. Uh, Big thing is uh, new projects uh, requiring a landscape permit greater than or, or equal to uh, 500 square feet are going to be required to uh, comply with uh, M. Wheelow. We're going to call it M. Wheelow, okay, because that's the short for Model Water Efficient Landscape Ordinance. Uh, it also applies to rehabilitated projects that are uh, you know, requiring a building permit, not just if you, hey, I want to do my yard, but you didn't trigger a building permit, but if it's a commercial or uh, you know, landscape area that is 2,500 square feet or more that requires a permit from some other purpose, either a landscape permit or a, uh, some sort of a building permit where landscape is a part of it. Okay? Now, with 500 square feet to 2,500 square feet in the residential category, that kind of falls to the prescriptive compliance, and there's more of a more or less a checklist that you can do that uh, home builders might now new on new homes will turn over a, a, a turnover package to the homeowner and they'll sign at that point saying that we're going to comply to the M Wheelow with the backyard 
or future modifications to our landscape. Um, and that's a prescriptive compliance checklist option. So unfortunately, you don't get to charge fees to the, the small little cookie cutter homes that, you know, in my neighborhood. Uh, but as people move in, you know, they're going to need to be cognizant of, eight, of the, the ordinance, and, and that's how we're, we're, we're hitting the smaller homes. So um, the uh, applicable projects do not apply to uh, state or federal historical sites. They also don't apply to uh, ecological restorations where you don't need permanent irrigation. So sometimes there's native or vegetation projects. It's a temporary grow in, get the natives going, and then turn it off. And um, then also mined land projects not requiring permanent irrigation. Sometimes there's, there's wetting uh, for dust control and things like that. And then, of course, plant collections, our arboretums, our botanical gardens, and places that the public can go and view. Uh, native plant or plant collections. Okay, this is the fun. This is the other big word. Ma maximum applied water allowance, also referred to as the MAWA calculation. Now, those of you that have been designing with a the previous version ABA 1081 know that the MAWA is the total water use that you're allowed to use for your site per year, right? And we take the uh, reference ET for your location, and we we determine that by the square footage. And then that will give you uh, a number that you can use for your total water use for your site. And then there's some subsets of that. Uh, the ET adjustment factor, ETAF, also known as, was formerly 0.7 or 70% of ET. So if uh, you know cool season turf or what it, your 100% adjustment factor was 100%, we're allowed to design to 70% of that. Okay. With the changes, residential is now 0.55 ET adjustment factor. So we can design to 55% of ET for residential. Commercial goes down to 0.45. Okay, so now what we're doing is we're talking about you know, how we're going to design more water efficient landscapes than we've done in the past. And I think this is going to, this is going to start to shape some of the direction that uh, might limit some of our, our options in terms of plants. But it'll also, again, it's going to help us reduce our water consumption. Uh, DSA projects, uh, 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 Division of State Architect is what that stands for, and that's basically K through 12 schools. That has an ETAF of 0.65. Okay, so schools are going to get a little bit more water. Um, you know, we want our kids to have a little bit more greenery to run around on, I guess. And then existing minor improvements that you might have, it's going to fall back to that 0.8 uh, adjustment factor, 80% of ET. Now, special landscaped areas. Uh, what is a special landscaped area? Okay. Uh, an SLA is classified as like an edible garden, uh, a place that um, is used for recreation. Okay, could be considered a special landscaped area. Uh, recycled water areas, uh, projects using recycled water. And um, one other thing, I'm forgetting. Uh, let's see. What's that? Uh, yeah, active use sports facilities. There's one more thing on there. Yeah, the, you, you've got the, uh, yeah. This is the one where our slides had the little cheat sheet on here. A water feature, yes, that's correct. Uh huh. So SLA means an area of landscape dedicated solely to edible plants, recreational areas, areas irrigated with recycled water, or water features using recycled water. Okay. So if let's just tackle recycled water right off the bat. It's a great resource if we can get an alternate water supply like recycled water. The purple pipe come into our project. It's great. Um, it's, it, it has to be designed in accordance with state laws. As we all know, there's some uh, requirements of recycled water that we don't want to take come in contact with the public. You get, point, you get 1.0 ETAF if you recycled water. Okay, so there's some breathing room there if you're using recycled water. Now, there's, there's uh, some potential changes to that, some modifications, which we'll get to in a little bit as it relates to the... Um, independent technical panel. I want to talk to you a little bit about that because now that we're already making these updates and I'm, we're, we're kind of briefing you guys on the updates, there's other 
folks that are already trying to update this again. So we're going to continue to see updates of this, and, and things might change a little bit more. But uh, water features should be classified as high water use, so factor of one. Temporarily irrigated areas shall be calculated as low water use. So even though we're going to temporarily irrigate them, um, they're considered low water use hydrozones, so you factor that in. And then the ETAF for existing special landscaped areas shall not exceed 1.0. That's just kind of a recap. Now, a, a local compliance that we're, we're looking at is for synthetic turf um, areas. The uh, city of San Diego, I believe, is using a low water use. Is that correct from it's the city? It's using low water use. And I know the county is using, considering it a moderate use. Okay. So your entire area irrigated or, or non-irrigated by uh, synthetic turf, there's an there's a impl implication that you're going to use water to cool it, clean it, whatever you need to do. So there is a water uh, factor for that as well. Okay. Now let's move on to soil management report. We got to talk about our soils and we got to know exactly what we've got. We got to try and encourage good water holding uh, conditions in our soil. We want to get healthy, active, living soils if we can. That's really important. Uh, so a soil analysis is really critical because we need to know where we start. What does our site have before we, before we break ground? So we need to get a soil report. And these are the things that are, that are required now for your soil management report. Always a good idea to get a soil report. You don't know where you're going unless you know where you start, right? Now it's a requirement. We got to do it. Client says, ah, eh, we don't need a report. Well, we do. So uh, we're going to take a sample rate for production homes, for example. In a new development, one in seven lots is going to need to require a soil sample uh, for residential development plots. And then now we go to the landscape design plan. So we've got our soil management report. We know what our soil is. Now we get to design the landscape. Here's the fun part. Uh, we got to achieve water efficiency, and there's some, there's some different changes in that. But the things that stay the same is we want to preserve our native species. Changes are we're really shifting toward using locally native plants. Locally native, not just native because it's native to somewhere, but locally native. As we all know, we've, talked, we've had that conversation before. Uh, and then, of course, climate appropriate plants, local climate suitability. And, and, and that's, it, you know, we were just at the uh, Quimaca College uh, conference. There was phenomenal speakers on locally native plants and, and just some beautiful examples. And then there's some not so beautiful examples that, you know, you see. But I think I, it's encouraging to know that we can, we can use natives and still have a, you know, a beautiful, attractive landscape. So it can be done. Trees uh, based on local, con uh, local ordinances, this is a big thing. We want to know we get the right tree, uh, the right size, right application. So we want to know what, what the tree size is at maturity, not when it's really cute in a little 15-gallon container. And uh, we don't want to tear up our streets and, and uh, sidewalks and stuff. So know what, know what it is to the plant, appropriate planting area. Pretty basic for most of you, but uh, we, gotta, we use uh, local plant uh, lists from uh, landscape programs, and there's a lot of those. San Diego County Water Authority has various uh, lists that you can use. I know ASLA, I think, has uh, some you know, local plants that are recommended. Um, and then the big thing is you know, your fuel modification. So we, we need to default to the fire code, okay? If you're in Rancho Santa Fe, they don't want you putting a palm tree next to the, right next to the building. There's certain things that, you know, different types of trees, we want to keep them, you know, in the right uh, vicin you know, vicinity in, in relationship to structures and fuel modification plans. And that might be, you know, uh, slopes and, and things like that. So check your local guidelines for that. As far as turf goes, now turf's kind of a broad you know, description of, you know, grasses and things like that. But turf grass were high water use landscaped areas or high water use landscape materials uh, such as turf grass uh, prohibited on slope areas greater than 25%. That's been there. High water use plants, aka turf, according to Governor Brown, is uh, prohibited 
in street medians. That was the first thing they came out and said. And I was like, hey, look, we got we to gotta get rid of high water use areas that are non-functional. Why would we waste all the water where we can't benefit from it? So that's a big thing. Shall not, turf shall not exceed 25% of the total landscape area on residential projects. That's new. Uh, prohibited on non-residential unless it's considered a special landscaped area, a recreation area, you know, schools, things like that. Uh, it's prohibited in parkways less than 10 feet wide, uh, or 10 feet or less, I should say, in parkways, unless it's in a parkway where the parking strip is used to enter or exit a vehicle. And I think builders commented on this because a lot of times they want the, 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 the green grass strip so you can get in and out of your car without stumbling uh, or slipping. It became a safety factor, so that, that is an exception. Soil preparation, you know, mulch and amendments. We're getting a little bit more prescriptive now in this. Uh, they're, they're actually requiring you to till and, and make sure you have uh, transformed your, your, your uh, planting surface into a friable condition, except for when it's on a slope. If it's on a slope, we just need to dig the area where we're going to put the plant in the ground, and that's all we need to disturb, okay? So there's, some, there's kind of some contention upon like, you know, how much area should be tilled or, or broken up, but that's kind of the way the ordinance is reading it now. So soil amendments shall be incorporated into the soil report. We need to know what we're putting in, pretty much based on, on what the report says. We're going we're gonna to need to know that we have to put amendments in if, if the report recommended it. And they're actually even recommending a, uh, a rate at you know, four cubic feet per thousand square feet must be incorporated uh, at a six inch depth. Okay, so soils with 6% 6 6 organic matter, things like that that are already complying, you don't need to do anything obviously, but uh, uh, it needs to be within the top six inches. So this is another one that gets a little sticky. Uh, mulch is required and three inches of it. It used to be two inches, now they're requiring three inches, uh, but 5% of the area may be left open for unmulched areas for wildlife, insect habitat, um, and slopes are exempt. You know, fire prevention guidelines, again, where, where mulch can blow around and become a fire hazard, uh, those are exempt. And then turf areas, creeping ground cover, and seeded areas. And there's, a, there's kind of a note on this that I think, in general, a lot of the native plant folks wanted to, to make a note of is that you're probably well served to not over mulch your native plant areas, particularly where the crown of the plant is, maybe keeping some of the mulch back in that area there. But it, again, the, the purpose of this, and it goes kind of back to what Ken was doing, is we're trying to keep the water on site. We're trying to retain the moisture in the soil. And, you know, mulch isn't a bad thing to keep weeds down, too. It's, it's good to, uh, you know, keep and protect living soils. But it really keeps the hydration and the, the moisture into the, into the soil. So in general, it's a good thing, but use caution around some of your natives. That's a, a more of a perspective, not the ordinance. Uh, and again, organic mulch, they're preferring that you use organic mulch uh, from, you know, recycled material rather than, um, you know, uh, materials that are, uh, you know, virgin forest products, things like that. Uh, and again, fuel modification guidelines, what type of mulch you use is going to be critical to your local guidelines. You doing okay so far? It's like drinking from a fire hydrant, isn't it? Two of these back to back is like sweet. I was thinking, I'm, I'm driving over here, I'm like, okay, 40 minutes, I'm gonna need to hit one of those six coffee crafts and I'd probably take one myself. <laughs> if, if I don't at least drink a cup of coffee before I come up here, like people are gonna be asleep. And so there's plenty of coffee in the back, but I don't know what good it's gonna do you in 20 minutes. Um, so anyhow, a lot of information, very condensed. You're getting it, you're getting it thick today. So water features, okay, uh, water features can be used, but they need to be recycling, uh, recirculating systems. That's, that's really, you know, the standard. Um, I don't know, I, I don't think I've ever really seen, well, maybe I've seen one, but I, I don't think I've seen many water features that just kind of dump water that don't recirculate. But a lot of people turn their water features off because they thought that they couldn't have them based on the last ordinance, and, and of course, public perception with evaporation, you know, I guess that's 
that's the prerogative. But it was recirculating systems. Recycled water should also be used whenever available. And the surface area of water features, basically a pool or your you know, overall water feature, you take the overall surface area of that, and that is uh, totalized in your estimated total water use calculation as a high water use hydrozone. We covered that before, but we get a lot of questions about that. Hey, gosh, I haven't done a, a water feature in a while. What was that again? Well, high water use based on the square footage. Recommend uh, pool covers and spa covers. Now you get to the irrigation design plan. This is the part that we like, you know, sprinkler geeks kind of think is the fun part, but not all of you do, apparently. <laughs> Based on calls that we get, oh God, can you just help me get through this? Yeah, that's not gonna do it. We're talking about permanent irrigation systems. So the irrigation design plan, it's a permanent system, not a temporary system. Um, projects are gonna require submeters, okay? Uh, Irrigation submeters. So what we do is we have a meter that supplies the whole facility, and our client wants to do some new landscaping, and it, it triggers the ordinance, right? We know that we have a meter for the water going in the building, but how much water would we be using outside of the building? They say, well, we don't have a dedicated irrigation meter, so just pull it off, of, tee it off of here and use that. Okay, well, we need to be able to monitor and measure how much water is being consumed exterior for irrigation. That's what we use a submeter for. So you have the city's meter or the local utility meter, and then you tee off of that, and now you have a submeter prior to your irrigation system. And that's kind of the definition of that in a nutshell. For non residential systems, we're thresholding it at 1,000 square feet or greater. Uh, residential is going to be 5,000 square feet or greater. So a little larger uh, residential lot, at least to today's standards, is going to require an irrigation submeter. Okay, greater than or equal to 5,000 square feet. Now submeters, to this is something that was kind of uh, brought up as a. It's in the ordinance, but it's kind of fuzzy. Can I use a, a flow sensor as a submeter? Well, they're really kind of two different things by definition, but it does say in the ordinance that you can use a flow sensor and it may function as a water meter uh, via section V490. We get that a lot. Hey, I got it. What, uh, what's a flow sensor? What's a you know, submeter? Can I use it as the same? There are devices that will act as both out there on the market, so you can actually have a submeter and it can send information to your irrigation controller. Those are great solutions. And then, you know, there is some kind of gray area, even though it's in blue. So, uh, <laughs> so controllers usually using ET or soil moisture sensors uh, data are, are, are required. Um, you know, so either either an ET based controller or something with a sensor that goes in the soil that's going to give us a reading to tell us, hey, I'm, I'm wet. Shut off. We don't need to water anymore. Um, something that's going to adjust the schedule, and then of course. Uh, it, Controllers equipped with non-volatile memory. That's something I wish I had because now I feel like as we get, you know, as, as we as we think back to what was it on the last ordinance? Well, geez, I can't even remember. It, you know, the, the controllers today tend to hold their programs in the event of a power outage. And and what we used to have is a controller that looked like the alarm clock when the power went out and it was flashing 12 o'clock, and it went to a default program, so it woke you up at 6 a.m. instead of 8:30. You know, which I, I, I don't wake up at 8.30, but people do, and sometimes it's annoying when your alarm clock wakes you up at 6 o'clock because it defaulted. But, it, you know, nowadays the uh, sprinkler controllers are going to hold that program for you, which is really critical because you've spent a lot of time investing in getting that cycle and soak program in your controller and the, just the pr program days of the week so you don't get fined for watering on non-water days. Uh, the controller is going to hold all that memory in the event of a power outage if it's got what's considered non-volatile memory. So manufacturers have taken note of that. The other thing we want to do is if we do have a rain occurrence, we want to avoid the embarrassment of watering in the rain. So rain sensors have become mandatory. You may have a weather-based ET controller that's pulling information from off-site. You'll still need to have a rain sensor on-site to prevent the water prevent the water from coming on uh, on your site because you know sometimes it rains other places where the where 
maybe it's not on our site, but then on our site it's raining, and you know it's really embarrassing to go out there with the rain on, with with the sprinklers on in the rain. You get a lot of phone calls too on the side to the business. Uh, freeze sensing uh, is an option as well, um, and then of course wind. You know you don't want to irrigate in the wind uh, most of the time. That, that's just bad for uniformity. So. Now pressure regulation, okay, so we get this question a lot. Do I have to use a pressure regulator? Where can I put the pressure regulator in the system? Does it have to be in the head? Well, as a manufacturer, I'll say yes, because that's a great place to put it. And you know, it's, it's nice because if you, if you do go and change out a system, it's nice to have a, a, a pressure regulator at the head because that's exactly where the nozzle is going to perform is within maybe four or six inches of that pressure regulator, so you know that every emission device has the same amount of pressure throughout the system. But it's not required that you do that, it's required that you have that pressure at each device. So when you look at a manufacturer's catalog, there's several good manufacturers, there's a few other manufacturers in the room, in our catalogs they're going to have a PSI number next to the product, and it's gonna recommend for in general like a spray head to have 30 PSI. So spray nozzles, 30 PSI, we're not using as many of those today. Rotating nozzles, 40, 45 PSI, rotors, 50 and 45 and up. So what, we, what we're looking for is that we get to that pressure. So if you do your calculations and you know that you got exactly 30 at that head, you might not need a pressure regulator. But if you don't have 50 or 60 PSI where you need a rotor, you're probably gonna have to put in a pump. And it's now required that you pressurize to get to the manufacturer's operated, or recommended operating pressure, okay? Just because we, it says it on our plan and it says, you know, X type of sprinkler throws X feet at 30 PSI, we need to make sure that when we were to go out to the site that is going to have 30 PSI at that sprinkler. Because we're designing it to that, and if we increase the pressure on that, it's going to have more water go through the sprinkler and our actual usage on site, our consumption would be different than what our plans read. So they're, they're really focused on making sure we have the right pressure at each emission device. Is that clear? This mud? Yeah, I probably butchered that. But Manual shutoff valve should be uh, installed as close as possible to the point of connection. That's great. So if you do have a break, people can quickly shut off the system and isolate it. So. Um, sometimes it's nice just because then you can still irrigate ports of your landscape if you do multiples in there and, and not have the entire site off if you have a mainline break. Backflow devices, standard to local codes, that's just standard. Flow sensor requirements, this is that other device that we talked about that's after the, at the point of connection, after the meter, we're going to have a device that's going to read and monitor flow and send information back to the controller. Now, those used to be optional. Uh, there's a lot of them that have gone in, you know, in, over the years and never really got connected. Now we're looking to make sure that these sensors are not only installed, but are actually reading at the controller. And all non-residential sites are required to have a flow sensor now. Some, some public agencies have required that for years, but now that's, that's new to uh, MWILO. And residential landscapes over 5,000 square feet need to have a flow sensor. Manufacturers didn't write this, I swear, because we probably we put probably would have added more in there about that stuff if we did. Uh, but uh, the the master valve requirement. Now, if you have a flow sensor, you need to be able to do something about that broken sprinkler that was registered on the flow sensor, because the flow sensor is going to send data back to the controller, and the controller is going to say, "Hey, wait, that's way higher than I saw last time, or when I learned what my flow should be, that's out of spec. So, what do I do now?" I want to shut the system off. So it can skip that zone, but what happens if there's still water flowing out and it's still reading after it thinks it shut off that sprinkler zone and tried to skip to go to the next one? So you need to have a master valve that can close down and shut off your main line back at the point of connection to respond to the flow sensors, uh, uh, actually the flow sensors data that the controller says, let's turn off the system. You have to have a master valve in order to shut off the main line, okay? Perfect. Normally closed master valves are recommended according to the ordinance. And also we got to uh, design our irrigation to prevent runoff. That's pretty standard, obviously. Uh, hydro zones. 
Hydrozones are like plant material. We we all know that we we don't want to design you know sprinklers and uh, mix sprinkler types, you know, drip and spray heads on the same line. That, of course, is not something you would have done anyway, but we need to design our irrigation based on the hydrozone with match precipitation rates. That means that everything over the given area is going to be watered evenly. And low volume irrigation devices are required in mulched areas, low volume. So that could be drip or some sort of other low volume irrigation device. Swing joints are required adjacent to hardscape and high traffic turf areas. A swing joint is something that will flex the sprinkler over so it doesn't break off at the base. It'll kind of flex over and prevent it from, uh, from leaking and breaking. Check valves are required at all emission devices where runoff may occur. So check valves are basically, it's a low head uh, drainage prevention device. Uh, so that gravity doesn't drain all the water out of your system. And those are required at all emission devices where runoff may occur. It used to be an option, now it's standard. Areas less, ten, less, ten, feet, or le or ten feet or less in width shall be irrigated with subsurface irrigation or other areas that do not allow overspray or runoff. Other means, I should say. So. This could be, you know, your, your subsurface drip tubing or some sort of a low volume uh, device that isn't going to back spray onto the hardscape and have water leaving the site. Overhead sh irrigation shall, be, shall not be permitted within the first 24 inches. This is that two foot setback from the curb on non-permeable surfaces. So if we work with the good folks over at uh, Fusco and you can and say, hey, can I need this thing to drain back into the landscape? Can I get all my sidewalks and any of my hardscape areas either use a non-permeable source like, you know, like a bell guard paver or something like that so the water's going to drain in? Or I need to get my sidewalks to drain back into the landscape? Or I need to move my heads 24 inches in away from the hardscape so I don't get any back spray that would otherwise run off and leave the site? Again, it goes back to the storm water quality thing. Slopes greater than 25% um, shall not be irrigated with an irrigation system that, that's over 0.75 inches an hour. And, and 0.75 inches an hour is, is a very, very low application rate as sprinklers are concerned. But if you think about rainfall, three quarters of an inch is quite a lot of rain in one hour. So think about that. We want to water the slopes at the rate that the soil could take it. And trees and shrubs need to be irrigated on their own dedicated valve. This is what we're finding now with the drought. Everybody's shutting off the irrigation, but we don't have a way just to keep the trees alive. So we need to be able to irrigate the trees on their own dedicated valves. Okay. So uh, emission performance uh, for devices. This is something that the state's taking very seriously. They're not just saying, hey, manufacturer, uh, what do you think your, how, what do you, what do you, what's your best guess at what your device is? Uh, efficiencies are and and what you know what are do you guys have any standards that we can use from you no they're saying we need an outside uh, third party and so the ASABE ICC standards is what they're using American Sci Society of Agriculture and Biological Engineer International Code Council and the minimum requirement for an irrigation device overhead is has a DU LQ which is a distribution uniformity lower Order. That's how efficiently does the device irrigate. It, where's the dry spot, essentially? The dry spots in the landscape typically are your lower quarter of efficiency or of, of um, uniformity. And that must be a minimum of 0.65 distribution uniformity lower quarter. And that's typically determined based on an irrigation uh, catchment audit. Irrigation efficiencies. This is the fun part for manufacturers, okay? This is where we get into our calculation of how efficient is that device that we're going to be putting on our, on our uh, plan. And overhead devices must be greater than or equal to 0.75 or 75% efficient. Subsurface drip irrigate, or drip irrigation, I should say, uh, minimum of 0.81, greater than or equal to 0.81. In some local jurisdictions, I think the county, uh, Dave could probably talk to this uh, in the uh, panel discussion in a moment. It's kind of it's it's a different approach, which is which is uh, a little bit more uh, specific. And its drip irrigation is going to have a 0.9. 
bubblers, 0.85, rotating nozzles, 0.75, rotors, 0.7, and conventional spray is 0.6. And the overall, so if you take your square footage of these irrigated areas by these devices, your total average, overall average, needs to be uh, 0.75. Okay, that last slide didn't get updated, so we're going to fast forward through that. Okay, so 0.75 is the average for all areas. Okay, so sorry about that. That was a little sleight of hand there. We didn't get that slide modified like we had thought we did. Um, so 0.75 is the overall average for slopes and flat space. Am I correct on that? Okay, good. So audits shall be conducted by a local landscape ag uh, agency landscape auditor or a third-party certified landscape irrigation auditor. Okay. It, unfortunately, it can't be conducted by those of us that designed it or those of us that installed it. So benchmark, find a friendly irrigation auditor that you can go have sign off your work because you're going to, you know, for, for the, the landscape contractor, we're going to need to have a third party go out and just verify that everything got put in correctly, that our nozzles are, 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 are uh, you know, pointed in the right direction, all the good stuff you're normally going to do. but. They're going to take and, and, and inspect the site even further. And now, uh, catch can audits, things like that, that's yet to be determined by local agency as to how, how detailed that's going to be. But what we do know is from the state's perspective is that if you did have that residential uh, subdivision and you're, you're going to go audit, you need to audit one in seven lots or 15% of the total developed area, developed site for a residential project. So we're almost there. Hang in there. A couple more slides. And audits shall be submitted with the certificate of completion and may be included, or may, may include, but not limited to, the site inspection, system tune-up, system test with distribution uniformity, that would be a catch can test, reporting overspray and runoff, and the preparation of an irrigation schedule. And the irrigation schedule is really critical. I think that's where the rubber meets the road on a lot of this stuff. Um, you know, smart controllers do a good job. But the state is requiring us to have an irrigation schedule as part of that. Uh, this is where the teeth kind of come into this. You know, it's like it's good to have a good design, but now they're requiring us to go out and audit the system. And if it, in, as we're starting to see in a lot of agencies, that is becoming a reality. So they're, they're going to check and make sure that this is actually happening. And then kind of lastly, we get into alternative water supplies. You know, we talked about recycled water as being a great option if you can use it. You get a Point, you get a 1.0, so that's a good thing as your um, starting point. But with stormwater and rainwater retention, the big thing is we're, we're following stormwater best management practices, so thank you for briefing us on that, Ken. And all, so all projects, and we're going to refer to local agency requirements because it's going to be different in the city of San Diego, possibly Carlsbad, the different jurisdictions that you go to. So. Uh, if you do a lot of work in a lot of areas, you're going to have to look at different uh, requirements there. And then all planted areas required to have uh, friable soils to maximize water retention and, and, and water infiltration. That's really big because if we, if, if, we can get the, if we get the soil to intake water better, we're going to have less runoff. And the water that we're using is going to be applied to the root zone where we want it and not in dry season runoff where we don't want it. Uh, rainwater, that's the other thing. <clears throat> Things have uh, changed. Rainwater, uh, we're, we're, again, the first inch or follow what Ken said for the first 24-hour event, um, the 85th percentile of a 24-hour of a event. These are all things that are going to be uh, kind of required by the, by the state. And, and that's something that the county has been very progressive with, and we've been getting on top of this, getting ahead of this, I think, in San Diego. Um, so the rest of those guys got to catch up. But recommended that projects incorporate uh, elements to improve you know, store, uh, storm water and dry season uh, runoff capture so that we do not have pollutants getting into our storm water and our um, watershed. Alternative gray water supply systems, they've really relaxed the plumbing codes to some degree or actually focused on the plumbing codes now to be able to accept gray water irrigation systems. Uh, where feasible. So, uh, for example, a, a, gray, a good use of gray water in a residential scenario might be, you know, your laundry. 
Uh, gray water is considered water that's come in contact, uh, direct contact with the skin, and then is going to be used for something such as irrigation. We can't drink that water, but we can get that water directly from the source and take it directly out to uh, our irrigation system. We can't store it, but we can use it to irrigate. And it must conform to the California Plumbing Code, so check your local agencies on that. The other thing is now, uh, it needs the water needs to be applied two inches below finished grade. Uh, the, there's some changes now to where you can actually take the, uh, from what I understand from the state's perspective, is that you can take the irrigation directly out to the landscape and cover it up with the mulch, and now that is acceptable for the gray water system. But we don't want anybody to drink the, the gray water thinking that it's okay to drink out of the sprinklers. So anyway, with that being said, I think that's about the last of it, unless anybody thinks I missed anything. Okay, great. So that's it. Thank you very much.